In his newest book, The Hidden History of Neoliberalism, How Reaganism Gutted America and How to Restore Its Greatness, Tom Hartman breaks down how the United States transformed into a neoliberal oligarchy and why it's time to correct course. Author and host of the Tom Hartman program, Tom Hartman joins us now. Welcome back to Rising, Tom. Good morning. It's great to be here with you both. Thank you so much for inviting so me. So my first question is this. Um, it's not. It's called neoliberalism, right? Like there's a, the the liberals um, definitely played a role in this. Talk to us about like why and how that happened. How did that? How did the Democrats end up embracing so much of this at the same time as 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 the Republicans? Well, there's kind of two pieces to this. First of all, the European definition of the word liberal is different than the American definition. And and the guys who invented neoliberalism were, with the exception of Milton Friedman, all Europeans. And so, um, in Europe, when you say liberal, what you're really talking about would, in the United States, be described as libertarian or conservative economics or Reaganomics or trickle-down economics. And they wanted this to be the new and improved version of that, thus neoliberalism. But you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, it, it, was, it was the Reagan revolution that, that imposed neoliberalism on the United States. But Bill Clinton was, you know, just fine with that. In fact, he doubled down on it by signing NAFTA and declaring the end of the era of big government and the end of welfare as we know it. And so we've had 40 years of uh, neoliberalism brought to us by both Democrats and Republicans. And now for the first time in those 40 years, we've got a president, Joe Biden, who's actually pushing back on neoliberalism, pushing back against it, which is really a good thing. Uh, I disagree. So how, how would you overcome my skepticism <laughs> that, uh, that, you know, un unleashing market forces to rage, uh, to, to uh, raise, you know, living standards and lower the price of goods and everything, that's, you're saying that's actually been a bad thing and we need more government management of the economy. Uh, is that what you mean by liberalism? Because the word neoliberalism gets used by a lot of people on the left in like a boogeyman context to refer to absolutely everything they don't like. I think even, even you would agree that it's a very you know, broad painting being assembled by that word. So what do you mean by it and, and, and what am I missing for why it's been so disastrous? Well, first of all, neoliberalism doesn't unleash market forces. Uh, market forces are like football, right? It's a game that people play with money. And if you play that game with decent rules, just like, you know, the NFL does with football, then the game works for everybody. And that's what we had before neoliberalism. That, that was basically Keynesian economics. We went from having fewer than 10 percent of Americans in the middle class in 1930 to 65 percent of Americans in the middle class in 1980 when Reagan came into office. It's now down to 45 percent because the, quote, government interference that actually produces a middle class. A middle class is not the normal state of capitalism. Read Dickens, that's the normal state of capitalism. And that was America in the, in the census of 1900, the average American income in today's dollars, family income is $4,300. 95% of Americans were poor, dirt poor in 1900. And so what neoliberalism has done with so-called free trade, which is basically let corporations go anywhere in the world for, for the cheapest labor possible, with by radically cutting taxes on the on the morbidly rich, which allows them to accumulate massive amounts of wealth in that they principally invest in instruments that do not churn, that do not perpetuate the economy, that do not stimulate the economy. What we've seen is a collapse of the middle. Oh, and 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 uh, you know the neoliberal battle belief that labor unions are an inappropriate interference in the so-called free market, and, uh, when in fact all they do is balance somewhat. The, real, the power relationship between employers and employed, um, these neoliberal principles have gutted the American middle class. And frankly, uh, you, know, I'm, I, I, you know, Biden and many uh, progressive Democrats in particular are calling for an end to it. I think it's a good thing. So here's my question. Um, um, I totally agree with you about everything you just said. Um, I don't think that the middle class is, an, unlike Robbie, I don't think it's a naturally occurring phenomenon of the market. I think that the shift from a market, a market economy based on you know production to one based on finance has been disastrous for the middle class. I, I, I totally agree with everything you're saying, offshoring NAFTA. My question is, is how come you don't give President Trump any credit? He was the one who got rid of NAFTA. He started a trade war with China, put tariffs 
tariffs on all of this stuff, he really jump started a return of manufacturing. Um, you know, the, to me, he really was the first one to take an axe to the to the sort of handshake agreement between both parties that enforced this neoliberal order since 1980, like you said. Well, how come he doesn't get any credit in this story? Well, actually, in my book, he does. Um, and, oh. and I think it's an important point. I mean, I wouldn't say he was the first to take an ax to it. Bernie Sanders has been singing this song since yes. 1980. <laughs> yes. And along with a lot of Democrats, Sherrod Brown, for example, has been in the Senate for yeah. a long, long time. And he's been arguing against trade deals and things like that. But but yeah, uh, Donald Trump, and this is one of the reasons why he became president in 2016, is he was the first um, Republican or Democrat since the Reagan revolution to come out and openly challenge neoliberalism. Now, now, a lot of what he was saying were just, you know, flat out lies. You know, he said he was going to raise taxes on the rich so that all his friends would hate him. Instead, he gave them a two trillion dollar you know, gift. Uh, he said he was going to empower the labor unions. And, and in, instead, he, he had, you know, his Department of Labor further gutted union rights. Uh, you know, and a lot of the stuff that he said when he challenged neoliberalism just turned out to be BS. And the tariffs that he did were done by executive action rather than by Congress. So they were largely symbolic. And, and mm -hmm. you know, most businesses in China certainly realized that they were largely meaningless, but they sold well. And, and I think that that's, as you point out, that's proof that Americans, even Republicans, are sick and tired of neoliberalism. And, and you know, the big challenge that Joe Biden has right now as he calls it out is that you, there's still a bunch of Democrats that are promoting neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. Joe Manchin inserted a provision into both the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act, requiring every penny that the government spends on those two pieces of legislation to go through the hands of a for-profit corporation, which is pure neoliberalism. And that was brought to you by a Democrat. So, you know, there's a struggle within the Democratic Party around this right now, as there is in the Republican Party. You, you referred to free trade kind of derisively a minute ago. I, my understanding is that, you know, upward like 95 percent or more of economists, not just neoliberal economy, but even under like a Keynesian worldview that free trade is absolutely beneficial, mutually beneficial, uh, you know, raise it, lowers the cost of goods and therefore makes everyone more prosperous, allows for middle class. There was no middle class, you know, prior to capitalism and free trade and some of those things coming along in the last, you know, 200 or so years. You know, if, if you say, right, we, we can, you could still have a social safety net or think there should be more of a social safety net, you know, without thinking that the, the government needs to manage trade or, or prevent free trade or something like that. I mean, the consensus is, is, is it not true that the economic consensus around those policies being good, like it's, it's more robust than the consensus around climate change being real or a number of things, or it's just as, just as, as strong. Like, are, are all those experts getting that wrong? Well, first of all, it's not all those experts. And and if we just, you know, did all this based on polling, we'd probably still have slavery. But, uh, you know, because there was a time when all the authorities in America were saying, gee, that's the way it should be. That's the way it's been for 10,000 years. Um, but but bottom line, uh, I agree with you that trade is a good thing. Trade brings lots of benefits to all kinds of countries. And that's why in 1791, George Washington reached out to Alexander Hamilton, his treasury secretary, and said, come up with a plan to build an industrial America. And Hamilton in 1793 laid this before Congress, which adopted virtually all of it, his 11 point plan, it was called the American plan. And that plan included tariffs on imported manufactured goods to give a, a, a price advantage to domestic manufacturing companies supports, price supports, encouragement for the export of manufactured goods, um, uh, uh, subsidies to industries that Hamilton and, and George Washington believed were essential for America, particularly defense industries, but also tech, tech, what back then it was called technology. And that American plan stood until 1981, and it built the, the, the most vibrant economy in the history of the world. And, uh, and in part, it, it built the middle class as well. In 1988, I spent November of 88 in China, and, and at that time, the Chinese government was in Beijing. I was, uh, I was staying, and at that time, the Chinese government was debating, uh, you know, the, the Maoism has collapsed. What do we do next? And there, there was one faction that said we should follow America and do neoliberalism. And there was another faction that said, no, um, we, should, uh, we should follow what America first did with the Alexander Hamilton American plan 
and adopt that and have a protectionist trade uh, policy. In other words, we'll aggressively engage in trade, but we'll do so on our terms rather than the terms of whoever's the biggest player in the world. And so China rejected neoliberalism pretty much at the same time that Russia was embracing it. And neoliberalism always, and, and even the free trade associated, the so-called free trade associated with it, it doesn't mean it's free. All it means is that the largest players get to determine the rules. Um, and the, the smaller players typically get squashed. We have, as a consequence of this so-called free trade, we have lost 60,000 factories and over 10 million jobs in the United States. And those are federal government numbers. And, and where did those go? Most of them went to China. China has, since they adopted the American plan, it's been 30 years now, they have had the fastest growing economy in the history of the world. The middle class of China is larger than the entire population of the United States. And it's not because of free trade, it's because of protectionist trade that China engages in. And we have seen a collapse here as a result of so-called free trade. I, I could not agree with you more. I, I think it so enrages me to see these, you know, these good working class jobs that provided millions of Americans with a middle class standard of living get shipped off to another country and build up their middle class. I guess my question to you is, so how do we turn the boat around? Like, what 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 do you hope to see um, in the coming decades, do you think, do you support the CHIPS Act as building another fab a good idea? Do you see, um, you know, the return of manufacturing as something that is a, a potential reality? I mean, do you see the return of unions as a potential reality? 6% of Americans employed in the private sector are in unions now. I mean, that, that to me seems like a really, like that we need something else because that's not coming back. Where do you stand on this? Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. And, and uh, you know, when Reagan came into office, a third of America was unionized, which meant another third of America had the equivalent of a good union job because the unions right. provide <laughs> local wage for us. So two thirds of America had good jobs. We had over 60, 65 percent of us were in the middle class. Um, now, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that's dropped by 20 percent. It's fewer than 45 percent of Americans are in the middle class because only six percent of the private workforce is unionized. And yeah, I, I'm, I am seeing, you know, in, in particular with the, the generation coming up, the Zoomers um, and, and, and the millennials, uh, you know, people are waking the hell up and going, hey, wait a minute, we had a system here that worked and it worked for, you know, several generations. And uh, this experiment has failed. Let's, let's dump it in the trash bin of history. So yeah, I, I, I totally see that happening and, and, and hope that you know, it picks up steam because you know, we, we have empirical evidence. We can look at the last you know, 80, 90, 100 years and just see what has worked and what hasn't. But the reason, the reason we can't keep factory jobs here is because it's, it's, uh, it's cheaper to, to offshore them in part because of regulations and things that, union, that labor has advocated for that have made it too hard for business to be done here, so they went elsewhere. So I, I, like how, how, do you, you know, how do you handle that? If you make it too costly to do business here, people will do business elsewhere, and then we're stuck in this reality. Like Labor wants to have it both ways. They want all the sorts of cushy protections, and then, but then also to have an industrialized country. Like You can't have both. Are you suggesting that America should say, OK, we're going to take a part of this country, let's say Louisiana, and turn it into a prison camp and force people to work for nothing, and we're going to allow child labor here in order to compete with China? I, I, I didn't say anything about forcing anyone to work. You said you want the jobs here. Let them be here then. Get rid of some of those restrictions that make it, that force companies to move them uh, overseas. Well, those restrictions are, are, you know, things that inhibit child labor and forced labor. <laughs> yeah, we should Why do you want to get rid of those? I, I do not want to get rid of restrictions on forced labor. I, but you're saying you want to bring the jobs back. But, it, it, no, but no one on the left why. is willing to do the things we need to do to bring those jobs back, which is to actually make it easier to, to build factories and have factory jobs here. I, I don't think that's ever going to happen, by the way, because I don't see any of the, the regulations that need to be gotten rid of to have that happen ever happening. So we're going to have the jobs overseas. Name one. What's that? Name one. Name one regulation that is causing manufacturers to go to China rather than manufacture here in the United States outside of the requirement that labor has to be treated fairly here in the United States. I mean, Name one. A, a, a minimum like wage, see. environmental impact policies that prevent you from building anything. Um, uh, right, so you want a dirty environment and you want an impoverished workforce. I, you know, I don't think Americans want that. 
<laughs> but, but, they, but you were saying, I mean, the left was that you want these jobs here, and I'm saying that's what it would take to do it. So if we're if we're not no, willing we, to do that, we're going to have those jobs no, elsewhere. We should just do the same thing China does. We should we should make it difficult to import manufactured goods, and we should make it easy to export manufactured goods. This is what we did prior to 1980, and it worked. It's what China's been doing since 1993, and it's worked fabulously for them. It was actually started, this whole idea was originated in, in England in the 1500s by King Henry VII. It was called the Tudor Plan. And when Alexander Hamilton came up with the American plan, he simply cloned the Tudor plan, which had built um, England into the largest industrial power in the world. And like I said, in 30 years, it's now turned China into the largest industrial power. Next year, their, their GDP is going to surpass ours. But all of the, the, both those plans did involve a much greater, li, uh, like a liberalizing force. I, I, I think we're getting tripped no, up maybe a little bit. Government interference in the marketplace. Well, but it was, it was less government interference in the marketplace than they had before, right? It was a it was a it was a directional of less government in the market. China has been growing like a weed because they have significant government involvement in the marketplace. The government protects domestic manufacturers and promotes export of manufactured goods. We abandoned that in the United States in the United States in 1981. With, with neoliberalism, and then Clinton doubled down on it with NAFTA and the WTO, and, and then uh, George W. Bush tripled down on that by granting China in 2001 most favored nation status. And the results of those things have been, like I said, you, you, you walk into a Walmart and find one product made in America. That's not how it should be. Sam Walton's slogan back in the 80s, they had big banners on Walmarts, 100% made in the USA. That's long gone. This is the result of government policy. It's not magic. It's not the marketplace. I don't know. Why, why should we care if it's made in America or elsewhere as long as it's, affor it's more affordable because it's made elsewhere because of the policies here? But I, we're, go we're going around in circles. Because we'd rather live in a wealthy nation than an impoverished nation. I'd rather live in a, on, a wealthy, on a wealthy planet. That, the, like the, we want to make everyone better off, right? Well, I'm I'm, I'm an American citizen, so I'm, and, and I can influence America. I'm not a Chinese citizen, and I can't influence China. So I'm, I'm speaking of America, and I'd like to have a wealthy America again, or at least a, a wealthy American middle class. I mean, we now have two men who control more wealth than the bottom half of America. That's nuts. Well, Tom Hartman, thank you so much for joining us. The book is The Hidden History of Neoliberalism, How Reaganism Gutted America and How to Restore Its Greatness. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Stay tuned for more Rising right after this.